Well, thank you so much for this um, uh, invitation to come to Haifa, which is the first time for me. Not the first time in Israel, but the first time in Haifa. And um, although I have many friends who come from here or are living here, it's amazing to finally see the place and visit um, Technion. We also had interns from Technion, so there's a lot of connections, and it was about time to also see it by myself. Thanks also for including me in this fantastic list of um, Blankstein lecturers uh, who um, you know, make it very honorable to be here. And also, I think the list of lecturers this year is amazing. Um, and uh, I'm sure that this is... Uh, Something to look forward to when Beatrice and Mark Wigley, Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley are coming end of July, who were my teachers in Princeton many, many years ago. So there is also some kind of relationship to, to that um, lecture series. I wanted to share today um, some kind of process and thinking of what's you know, behind our development when we do designs, but also think about public space, infrastructure, and also conversion sites, when maybe it's a very initial personal thought or uh, observation that once you get into it deeper and deeper, develops into an architectural proposal, especially when you talk at a school, university, um, with students, um, which is all about understanding that ideas don't come just like that. It's, a, it's, it's hard work to develop and um, do research and search for an articulation that expresses um, why you're using architecture as a medium to make a contribution to our everyday life, to our culture, to our the construction of our urban environments. So um, the talk will be about very small scale all the way to urban interventions and maybe go back into a very small scale. It's also about, um, let's say, a, a starting point, which is the surface, which is basically the first element that we see and touch when we are inside a space or look at uh, you know, our built environment and look into how these surfaces are constructed, how they are um, dealing with information, how they are actually negotiating between inside and outside and private and public, and all of that becomes somehow, um, uh, uh, let's say, ingredients for the construction designing of space. Um, one of the very early, let's say, discoveries for me to think about this are these data protection patterns that you find on the inside of envelopes or when you get PIN numbers from your bank or even you know, inside of envelopes or salary slips. And these patterns um, were somehow developed, at least that's the oldest source I found, by a printing house in Berlin called Berthold. When I was at Bessalel about 20 years ago um, in, uh, in, in the print shop, I saw actually prints of Hebrew writing fonts on the wall displayed in the print shop, which were from Berthold. And Berthold was one of the, or maybe the leading company for uh, printing and also type development. So um, when I did research on when these patterns were developed, this was the oldest source around 1900. Uh, or 1910, um, the oldest catalog source that I found where these patterns were offered in, in their, um, as, a, as a product, basically. It's patterns that are maybe developed um, as an efficiency tool in administration. Um, for those of you who still remember typewriters, um, I still do, <laughs> the younger generations don't. You could write original and copy at the same time. You could write uh, the invoice, the shipping slip, and the copies at the same time but not everybody needs to know all kinds of information. So in some areas, um, in the invoice maybe, uh, or in the shipping slip, it has to be blocked out or erased, camouflaged. And so these different patterns are also called um, confusion patterns or um, what well German words would be, verbal, like con yeah, confusion patterns or camouflage patterns. And um, they come in all kinds of variations. They come as patterns, they come as uh, letters, numbers, and usually I think that's how it started. 
if you know carbon paper and all these kind of duplicates that you'd write, if you use a carbon paper on a typewriter many times, that's basically, um, I think, where it came from. But also, since all of these could be written at the same time, it was, you know, first of all, an, an efficiency tool which then needed to um, create certain strategies like erasing that information on other copies. So these patterns, which are fantastic thing to collect because they come for free to your house basically every day. Um, are, these are pin numbers, for example, from your bank. Are um, uh, for me a, a, a model to think about how an envelope slash building envelope divides between these conditions of inside outside concealing privacy or personal information versus exposure or um, I could say a neutral outside how certain windows, as in also envelope windows, um, are giving certain addresses or personalizing uh, you know, that item. Here you see, for example, a shipping slip where if this is printed and also inside, once you take these multiple forms apart, would tell you, um, you know, how expensive this object was that was sent to you. On the front cover, it will be printed inside this confusion pattern and therefore be not be readable. Um, I'm collecting these patterns for the last 20 years now, or even longer, and I think I have about 300 different of these patterns. Um, these are coming in uh, camouflage uh, or landscape patterns. They come as just very regular uh, graphic designs. They come, um, in this case, n names of cities, um, or even companies use their own data protection patterns. There is no real like norm how confusing or how big or how small they should be. I think it's somehow uh, an experience or a test what works and what doesn't work. But inside of envelopes, it's basically when it's still not opened and you hold it against the light, somebody who would have that letter in their hand couldn't read what's written inside. So it's all about creating this, you know, this control mechanism of information that um, might be the last visible idea of data control before all kind of becomes invisible or um, digital, where these things that we experience still as a material device um, now, you know, works as certain filters and firewalls and and blockages and passwords um, in the in, in the digital world. So these patterns are somehow starting points, these surfaces that have information value or actually work against information value, but they are exactly there where it's between inside and outside, a negotiation level between these conditions that I described before, between discretion and exposure. Um, and that's becoming a role model or let's say a starting point to explore what the spatial condition is exactly inhabiting this ambivalence between these conditions. So we take, in the next couple of steps, um, these patterns and enlarge them and make them three-dimensional. Um, not that every building now is developed exactly according to a certain pattern, but the first projects to go from small to large, um, I would like to show you how we um, see this as a reading device for our buildings. In this case, it's an exhibition installation for Berlinische Gallery, which is the State Museum of Berlin which hosts architecture, photography, and art, all kind of related to Berlin, or from Berlin artists, architects, and um, designers. In this case, we took a pattern and enlarged these numbers to like a human scale, printed that on a carpet, um, and enveloped that space with it. So it became a fun thing also for school classes to start reading you know, the numbers and letters in there, but what was maybe more important was how these small objects here were dealing with these patterns as a three-dimensional entity. Um, the rule for these 3D prints were that from one side, when you look at them from one elevation, it's exactly the pattern that we found, enlarged, but once you move around, actually there's a certain three-dimensional interpretation or construction behind it from that pattern. These are just different like patterns or let's say small extractions from these patterns. You could just basically add them. Um, and in this one, you see it most clearly. This is the, 
the pattern as it was found, five, seven, nine, I, don't know, I can't read it from here really. But once you turn around, you see how we then started to make this a spatial skeleton. So these layers or these patterns were layered step by step behind you know, each other and then started to be fused from one layer to the other. Others might be you know, three-dimensionalized by extruding them or having two patterns run through each other, um, creating a spatial complexity um, starting from a very simple two-dimensional surface. So if you have this in mind kind of as a reading device, how we think that this, very much, this, this layer that has all these kind of conditions of negotiation now becomes the space in itself, this would be somehow um, an ideal condition for that. We designed, um, and this might be the next spatial step in terms of its three-dimensionality, uh, an exhibition designed for Volkswagen, which was about sustainability and um, mobility. And you see the very simplistic um, recycling triangle. That's maybe the first time when we thought about how sustainability and consumption would, um, would work. Uh, of course, nowadays we know it's not as simple as that. There are dead ends, it's a confusion. Uh, about you know what are the or uncertainties, what are the right moves um, to move, produce, or um, consume in a sustainable way? There are all these interdependencies. There are these dead ends. There are these um, let's say detours. But this became somehow the image or the the reference for an exhibition design that's embedded with a lot of information technology, with a lot of objects, um, updated um, interactive surfaces. Uh, somehow this forest of information, or um, it's more like a thicket of information that you can enter. On the next larger scale, um, a dining hall for the University of Karlsruhe. Also here you can see this skeleton being uh, developed in a three-dimensional entity, so there is not just a facade and an interior, but it becomes somehow um, uh, let's say a three-dimensional object that you can penetrate. That's a skeleton of, um, of, um, of bones, sticks, but all somehow connected to each other. So there is not just a tectonic addition to it, but it still envelopes you. There is a surface, a polyurethane coating that wraps the whole timber into one entity inside and outside. Um, there is a continuation of one dimension into the other from horizontal to vertical into the other um, horizontal entity. There's also the skin that wraps around the entrance. Um, it continues down into the floor. Although it all looks the same and it's all the same green color, this polyurethane coating is, has different entities on different levels. And that's when somehow then the intelligence comes in. What looks so simple as one object means that behind or within the material, behind, within that skin that we are um, you know, wrapping the building in, needs to be different properties, needs to be different um, uh, forces at work. If, this is, if the floor is all about durability and like strength, then maybe the walls need to be about diffusion and breathing of the material. Um, then the ceiling has to be about acoustics and absorbing noise. Um, so everything somehow happens within or behind that surface that's wrapping it. Um, here you see some of the night views. Then on the next scale, this is a courthouse in Belgium. Um, we take this to even into a level of a, a small high-rise. It's on the West 8 master plan um, by Adrian Gers uh, in Hasselt. It's in Belgium, a conversion site next to the train station where the parking garage in the park actually is by West 8. And this building, which is part of a competition or was the result of a competition, um, is based on the grid of the parking lot, um, which is a two-story parking here. The competition asks for um, the articulation of a specific urban development along the train tracks of, uh, of Hasselt. And what's interesting about the name of Hasselt, it comes from hazelnut, hazelnut trees. Um, and the logo already has these two hazelnuts talking to each other, embracing each other, which is a first step towards a community. So only if we have two who start to have a dialogue, we start to create um, a community, or it's a kind of a social understanding of that city. When you look at Hasselt um, in, in history, there are always two high points in the silhouette of the city, which come from important moments of the city history. So you have these two Gothic towers, um, that you have these two high-rises from the 
middle of the 20th century, which is the town hall. And then the new site also asked for two towers. This was the master plan by West 8. <coughs> Not the building itself, but you know that there uh, should be two high points. Um, and this is again our scheme in relationship to the silhouette of the city as it is or was at the competition stage. There are certain references that we um, took uh, with our project, and I think it's important for our work to shift with um, scales, but also to create a certain, let's say, iconography, which has no only one interpretation. Um, every idea of like what people read into this is correct in a certain way. But of course, there are certain guiding elements maybe that help us to come to these um, schemes. One would be, for example, you know, the huge metal trusses from the train station, also the cargo area that was there before. Then even, you know, the, this is the courthouse now of Limburg, um, the tree as a symbol for like the place in a small village where the village would gather, where they would actually judge, where they would make decisions, where they would actually um, even have like a, a kind of a court situation um, is some of the references and we ma even managed to have timber on the facade all the way to the top. Inside is a concrete structure based on the, on the, on the grid of the parking garage and there are three elements. One here is um, the courtrooms on the other side of this building and uh, the offices. This is uh, the part of the university, the, the justice department. And then up here also more offices and um, a roof restaurant or canteen. <coughs> then you know, we have these double layers for sun protection and uh, environmental issues, a double window um, for climatic control. And uh, this became quite an interesting project. Our budget was quite, you know, specific, um, and it had to be one of the first buildings that the uh, Belgian government wanted to be, you know, cost efficient because all the courthouses before were quite expensive or run over budget. So now we had to kind of prove that this is also possible within um, a different mindset. And we worked together with A2O Architekten and Lens Us from Belgium, from Hasselt to collaborate on that project. So this is the dining hall on the roof. Here, as you see again, this part is for the courtrooms, this one is the university, and then these are the offices with the resident on the top. And the park by West 8, which is kind of a green slope with a parking garage along the train tracks. But we made it to the, to onto a beer bottle um, as part of the uh, icons of Belgium, which of course makes us very proud. Conversion sites is uh, a big issue for architects these days, and this is another conversion site in Düsseldorf, not too far from Belgium, um, where we built a university building for FOM University. Um, and it was quite a complicated site. We had to connect to a bridge, which is on a higher level. There's a park on the lower level, which is the main entrance. And um, this was... Oh. Something happened. Okay. So... Yeah, then um, I think something was skipping here. Uh, the university you know, um, is one of the issues that uh, becomes an important part because it's a public, uh, you know, it's a public site down here on a conversion site, and this train um, track that runs over here and the bridge that's connecting here, and to create this kind of connectivity between the different levels was important. Um, we have all these extended balconies, which are waiting areas for, uh, in case of fire, so we could reduce the inside um, circulations and um, uh, therefore create more space for school uh, rooms and, uh, and meeting places than uh, what was usually uh, necessary for uh, without having these. Um, I think this is a... Uh, I, I was prepared actually to talk about this project longer, but I see there is some shift in the presentation. Um, I give you a little bit panorama of what different projects are that we are involved with before I start clo getting closer into the next one. This is the same university in Berlin. Also here we're dealing with a certain new form of construction. This is a infra light concrete, which means we have um, no insulation on the outside. It's a fossil-free facade. Um, it's a building that, again, comes across as a, as a sculpture. At the same time, it has this, um, 
this continuity all the way up, but it's one thickness which is 60 centimeter deep wall, um, and uh, it, it can be done up to about six stories, which is here, before um, it might have been important to add another form of like higher like stability of concrete. But in this case, it's a building that um, will be another sustainable um, example, and we hope to start it by the end of the year. This is a um, housing high-rise in Düsseldorf, which is almost done now. And um, again, it's a building that deals a lot with the issue of the facade. There's a very noisy street here, so the facade tries to also absorb some of the noise for the housing. <coughs> this is a, uh, a building for a software company in Bavaria with a timber facade, also under construction here now on this level. Um, another conversion, which is an old train station in Potsdam, um, with a, a new building that runs across it for a campus based, focused on virtual reality and digital technologies. Uh, this one we started construction, which is an office building in Berlin. Just to give you a little bit of an example where we go with our architectural language um, in its kind of exploration of spatial three-dimensionality. And this one is an extension for um, an art collector who um, makes this into a George Grosch Museum in Berlin uh, with an extension for his housing. Uh, this is a train station and tram stop in Freiburg, already uh, almost finished, and this one, similar uh, tram stop in Kiel, which is the only transnational tram, uh, tram uh, line now between France and Germany, or actually in, in, in Europe, but this is running from Germany to France. Um, we got into the, uh, the, the infrastructure projects uh, mostly with work that we did in Georgia. And this was something that started out of the blue around 10 years ago when we got a call for a project in the center of Tbilisi. In the end, this didn't happen, but it was the beginning of a conversation on many, many um, projects. And all these blue spots that you see here are potential um, sites or verb actually buildings that we realized. Tbilisi is here. Um, you have the, sub, uh, the, the highway that's actually constructed all the way to the port. And then this is the coast to the Black Sea, um, Sarpi, border station to Turkey. Um, this is the high Caucasus with a development mostly for tourism, um, here for skiing and also hiking. So when we got um, asked, um, by the former government, it was all about really developing an infrastructure to make the country run, to offer, let's say, visibility to people who use it, use it mostly as a, as a transit country from maybe Turkey to Azerbaijan, to also understand that um, buildings along uh, these tracks like rest stops, um, checkpoints, uh, were all, or train stations were all part of an, uh, an, an architectural culture that um, is important, speci specifically for a country that is you know, going through such a dramatic transformation. And I'm comparing it a little bit to Germany in post-war times, where things had to be done very, very quickly. Maybe they're not standing there for more than 30 years or you know, 50 years, but it's something that had to be established to um, have a train station you know, for international train tracks um, running from Turkey to Azerbaijan, for example, that we built here. This is the train station in Ahakalaki that we built there. Um, this is a rest stop between uh, Tbilisi and Batumi uh, in Gori. And what's interesting is that these rest stops were also built in areas where there was no highway yet, where there was um, uh, importance to introduce supermarkets, for example, which haven't been there yet. It was all just introduced about 10 years ago, um, where there's an arts and crafts market, um, for example, or small rooms to show you what the culture is in that part of the world or in that part of uh, Georgia. Um, they would actually also introduce, uh, of course, a certain, let's say, echo maybe of Soviet architecture that we wanted to, you know, uh, cr create an awareness that is also kind of valuable. At that time, it was somehow not, um, you know, so much in the focus at that time. And um, you see also in how important these projects were or are when um, we were there for the opening 
and heard that two or three couples already asked if they could have their wedding ceremony um, or their wedding party after the ceremony in the rest stop um, from that area. So that's also somehow a sign how important or let's say how, how curious um, people were at that time to create a certain, let's say, outlook into the future. This is the rest stop also in Goyo on the other side of the street. We also built this um, checkpoint here at the border of Turkey, which is, I think, a fantastic sign how to welcome visitors or how to say goodbye. And it was a rest stop that was, uh, or it is a rest stop that has a completely different understanding what a border can be. It's not so much a line between two countries, between, you know, to separate and create security, but also it's actually more considered to be a meeting point where either you go there for a beach, but you could also really come and meet there. And this is what the government wanted to introduce. It's not a line that separates, but it's a place to meet and um, unite. So similar maybe to a hotel where at, yeah, at, at an airport that is a conf conference hotel and you can you know do your business there. On top of the rest uh, of this um, of this checkpoint here, you would have meeting rooms and conference rooms that you could um, that you could rent. You could have family parties here. You can have a beautiful view over the Black Sea. Um, these are the conference rooms above the checkpoints and. Uh, when you have the section, you see how it actually works on all different levels. This is a view from one of the conference rooms across the Black Sea and the view at night. Another project is this very tiny little airport that we built in uh, Mestia. It's in Svanetia, it's in the higher Caucasian mountains. It's very difficult to get there. Um, you can only fly when there's very you know, good weather because you have to go across this saddle up here and the plane might be just like 40, 50 meters above the ground for a second before it goes down. Um, but it's this beautiful old town with these old stone towers, um, which is UNESCO World Heritage. You see these towers here, which they were built for um, storage, but also for protection to actually s escape into them when there's another rival uh, gang running through the, uh, through the valley. But this tower, of course, refers somehow to these towers here. It's a very simple airport. You have the tower um, before checkpoint and after security, um, or before security, after security. So all three um, directions are combined here. And you, oh, sorry. And you have here one axis, the other axis, and the third axis here. It's only 270 square meters, so it's very tiny, but um, they already talk about extending it. We have um, uh, a lot of tourism now, which is uh, hiking is a big business now in, in, in Georgia, and also skiing now becomes uh, a big uh, topic. This is a small town hall in the same village, um, which looks like this at night, and a police station also um, in Mestia. The last project I want to show you in that we did in Georgia is this um, sculpture here, and it shows you somehow um, how much vision you know, can be created and how much uh, loneliness can happen at the same time. Um, Saakashvili and his uh, government had the idea to build a new port in the city for 500,000 people at this um, place in, in the Black Sea. And it was considered to be possible there because the Black Sea is a quite flat sea, but at that point there was a possibility to go a little deeper to also introduce bigger ships um, and uh, have a, a larger port. So one of the starting points was to create this sculpture, the pier, um, as a needle somehow to say um, it's, it's happening now. Um, and this was built in parts, um, uh, shipped then to, to this coastline and then put together. But after it was finished, also the government changed, the new government kind of stopped um, the further developments. So and now it's maybe one of the most loneliest public places. Um, there are sometimes uh, some uh, people who try to catch fish. Um, when I was there, there were three students from Finland there um, who wanted to look at the project. These were the parts that were produced in Turkey and shipped onto the site and then put together um, to create this 
sculpture that still sits there at night, um, glowing and kind of sentimentally looking into the future. Another project that deals with a different understanding of, um, let's say, visibility um, is a museum garage or a garage, a parking garage that we were part of in Miami. It's called the Museum Garage. In the beginning, it was actually named Collage Garage, and I'll tell you in a second why. Um, it's a project that was curated by Terence Riley, who is the former curator for architecture and design at MoMA, um, who then moved to Miami. Um, he invited five, four architects to work with him on this facade, and it's only the facade. There is a very standard concrete skeleton inside um, with uh, offices and um, high-end shopping on the ground floor. There are now private museums, the De La Cruz family collection and um, also the ICA in Miami moved across the street, so that's why they moved it into Museum Garage, because that's somehow more of a destination that they have in mind. Um, but the idea of the collage garage comes from the, from the concept of core deskies, um, exquisite corps that we all know as a children's game, one starts to draw a face, then you only, s then they fold the paper, you only see the neck and then the next person, you know, adds to it. So it's kind of a constructed, um, uh, body or a constructed, uh, entity that comes without the knowledge of the other participant. And then once you unfold it, there is a kind of a, a surprise, an extra that wasn't be able to be done without um, that, uh, let's say, ignorance of the others. So um, if you take the elevation as uh, unfolded, there are these five segments, one, two, three, four, five. This is work AC from New York. This is us. This is uh, Nicolas Buff, a French guy who lives in Tokyo. Um, this one is Manuel Clavel from Murcia, Spain. And this is Terry Riley um, at, uh, from Riley Keenan. So here you see some uh, you know, the, the, the concept. And that's why he called it Collage Garage in the beginning. We all had to basically design a proposal for our facades, then it was kind of mixed, put next to each other, and then we had to start to negotiate with each other how to create the connectivity. And here you see us being in between Work AC and Nicola Biff. Our concept, and once we were placed within these, uh, into, into this network, was to take our initial idea of, um, let's say, organic shapes that were floating kind of creating a certain uh, references to car lights. This was our, um, our starting point. We also realized that it had a certain, let's say, relationship to its neighbors in different ways. Uh, it was kind of an inversion of a skin that has holes to now the holes or let's say the objects floating. So it was an inversion here. And we took patterns um, that were part of Keenan Riley's concept and enlarged them and also superimposed that to our our shapes here. So it was embracing both ends and creating a certain meeting point for those on our uh, facade. This was the starting point with us car lights and then once we developed that further, it turned into this segment here, which is this floating parts embracing the concept from one end and the other one. Um, it was opened about a year ago and Already, of course, like everything now, basically becomes an Instagram hotspot in Miami. Um, you see it on many, uh, you know, all, uh, all the time on social media. Also, the work AC part has um, an art piece, which is like replaced and changed uh, in uh, maybe every one or two years. Um, they had about one and a half meters facade around the corner, so they could introduce some stairs and also a public library or at least a shelf where people could place books and so forth. Um, but all the others, um, we had a very thin layer of like two to three feet. And I'm showing you quickly some images of that. Uh, and you see like the subtle like relief that we were able to create on that surface. This is Nicola Buff. Um, also here he had certain references to transportation. You see the elephant with the obelisk, um, manga references, um, car bodies that were casted from um, existing cars and then re-reproduced. And Riley Keenan's proposal, which comes from uh, this typical barrier elements on Miami streets. And I think it's also developed by somebody from um, 
from Miami originally. And I think here we have, um, let me see, a small video where we want we get a better understanding of the scale of the building. So another project in the States is this um, installation called Triple X, Times Square with Love. It's an invitation from the Times Square Arts Alliance who asked us to uh, come up with an in intervention that would rethink the idea of the Times Square um, experience. And one of the ideas that we had was to create a different view, not onto the facade, but looking up or being looked at when you look down. So social media, maybe there's you no know, other place in the world that is such a media um, embedded um, public space as Times Square. At the same time also, um, it is one of the busiest public spaces maybe. We wanted to create that relationship that looking down is as much as something that you know is looking up. And you have about, you know, 25 webcams at least that look down onto Times Square that you can log into at the same time um, resting and experiencing it from a different point of view also was a uh, reference. But um, the general um, geometry came from <coughs> the inter intersection of Times Square and 7th Avenue. So that's somehow one of the local references. Um, it's placed next to the recruitment pavilion um, that you see here. Uh, from the top. It's maybe the safest place where you can sleep in New York because there's always two, three guys with machine guns sitting, standing next to you. But also it refers to maybe a little bit of a CD history of Times Square and 42nd Street. And this was something that uh, was interesting to Times Square Arts Alliance because they often get accused of forgetting about the history of that area, that it's also hygienized um, or like cleansed um, with just big brands having their shopping experiences there. So the kind of the kind of maybe a little bit ironic twist back to, you know, the recent history of that place was part of um, also uh, re reading um, Times Square as a different experience. Also, the geometry somehow helps to create a certain, let's say, communication aspect to it. Once you sit in, you start to have to talk to other people who can, you know, put their legs um, uh, into the center or like if you have to like retrieve um, if somebody you know can lie next to you all of that became you know initially also a part of the design of these um, seating elements and once it was open it was maybe one of the most busiest uh, and most occupied um, f seat furnitures that um, existed there it works you know for all moments uh, maybe at night it's even more busy than during the day and here you see some of the webcams that look onto you. Um, you see the triple X at this point. But this whole, um, let's say, media part was not um, possible to realize within the time frame and the budget. But you see the concept, you know, with the webcams being up here, looking down at you, you looking up um, into the sky. But you could maybe log into these webcams and see yourself through um, these cams on your mobile phone. That kind of loop was interesting for us in the initial design process, but we could couldn't actually make it happen. But we simulated some of the views. There is um, a Snapchat filter that we created um, that happened. And uh, we also simulated some of the you know, selfie images that could be done when you're there. Once it was opened, um, this was uh, in the taxi um, screens uh, when you drive home. So it was already part you know, of the, let's say, the, the story of, of Manhattan at that time. And if Times Square doesn't get media attention, where can get media attention, um, or who can get media attention. But it was already two weeks later um, part of the, uh, let's say, coverage of the New York Times on the real estate in that area. And um, once you get really tired of moving around and looking, you know, what's possible there, you could in the end rest on Times Square on these seating elements. And a couple of 
weeks later. It was even considered to be one of the, you know, imagined, reimagined places or in public spaces in New York. So even these very small, like, you know, objects that are, you know, if you're walking there, you might not even see them because they're constantly moved around, can completely change at least the perception or the aura of a place by referring back to a very specific reading of, um, of history. And the last project, which I can show you now in a, let's say, more complex way, is our building in Sevilla, Metropole Parasol, which we finished in 2011 um, after a competition that happened in 2004. It's one of the largest timber constructions in the world, and it's something that um, really changed the whole, let's say, aura of the city, which was also part of the goal when it was constructed. The competition launched in 2004 to rethink this public space in the center, which was the former food market. And this food market uh, was taken down in the 70s in one part, and then uh, or actually in the 50s already in the lower part, in the 70s in the, in the northern part, to create um, the end point of a public transportation, which is a bus line. But you see that this very dense, uh, medieval town center of Seville, um, maybe the largest medieval town center that we have in Europe, um, has a couple of really you know, big buildings and parks and openings, and Metropole Parasol or Plaza de la Encarnacion is one of them. But you see the bullfight ring here, you see the cathedral, the castle, and the royal gardens. So it has <coughs> a lot of potential um, for, let's say, uh, creating moments within that very dense fabric but only in these areas where you can actually create a certain opening. Um, this is a view from north to south, where you have the cathedral, you have um, the old tobacco factory, that's where Carmen you know, was taking place, the opera. This is the bullfight ring, um, and this is Metropole Parasol. It's a project that defines a public space on many, many levels. So it's the ground floor, of course, that has shading, but then you have a big roof that you can go up to. You have a panoramic walk. There is also a space for cafe and a meeting place uh, and, and, and meeting rooms that you can rent. And it really bridges the development from the southern part of the medieval downtown to the northern part. And in 2004, when the competition was launched, it was the northern part was a little bit shady still, or let's say not really dangerous, but it wasn't really lively and it was not maybe so safe to walk there. But the southern part was extremely well you know, developed. You had the town hall, you had the cathedral, all the shopping streets were here. So the hope was that this project here bridges that development to the north, so very local, let's say, dynamic uh, factor. But also, Sevilla wanted to be competing with other Spanish cities who already built their, uh, their, you know, their, their, let's say, energizing projects like Valencia or Barcelona. And um, on an international level, of course, to attract tourism but on, and business uh, and showing the innovation factor of the, uh, of the city. This was the situation before the competition started. There was an idea to build a parking garage um, underneath the Plaza de la Encarnacion, and already the concrete walls were built, um, the earth was taken out, and after six meters of taking the earth out, um, all of a sudden they found all these Roman ruins and mosaics, and um, basically a window into the history of the city on that scale that's not possible anywhere else, and also very much in the very heart of the city. You see these buses here, this was the end point for the bus line, and the market was running all the way from north to south till here. This was the part that was taken down in the 50s, and this was the part that was taken down in the, um, in the 70s. Um, this was the ta part taken down in the 50s, this one in the 70s, and you see it was somehow a city within the city. Um, that market is supposedly was very run down, so that's why it was taken down. And also, the city grew a lot in the after the 1950s or in the second half of the second uh, of the 20th century. So the city became too big to be kind of um, served through this market in the very center, and they moved the market away. 
I think today we, we would do everything to keep and save um, this structure. But in the 70s, the idea was to introduce more cars, um, to also create a, uh, let's say a public space, and um, there was no really value added to this um, old historic city. But you could also see that the facade the market are very um, irregular facades because they were never built like Plaza Mayors or Plaza Reals in Madrid or Barcelona as, um, um, let's say, uh, facades around the plaza. They were just basically the opposite of their buildings were ripped out when the former ministry monastery was enlarged and it was replaced again by the food market. So it was just fabric that was taken away and all of a sudden a small building became a plaza facade. So this one here was the situation until maybe the early, around 1990, 1995, um, where the parking became a temporary parking lot. And this was the temporary situation for about 30 years. When the competition started, it was about thinking what is 21st century public space, how can um, we introduce a different form of understanding how history, which is archaeology, and the contemporary architecture can be combined into one project. Uh, we started with introducing shadow as the first idea, so the idea of the roof and the structure became um, the guiding principle. We wanted to see how the shading device then could create a certain atmosphere that allows people to really enjoy um, the plaza during the day, but also adding all this program that was asked us to introduce, like market, um, keeping the archaeology as an archaeology museum. So here are some of the studies, and then this is what we proposed for the competition, or then developed afterwards into this structure, which um, is open to the sky, um, and we had to collect the forces from this roof on very selected points where we were allowed to go into the foundation, into the archaeology. Then, of course, some reference that references that you find here, for example, these old um, trees uh, on a neighboring plaza, so something that was built and constructed um, at the same time. Also, the undulated roof of the facade, uh, of, the, of the roof of the cathedral, which was a reference point for our project. And then when you're inside the cathedral, this is you know, what you then see, the structure as the space-defining element. Um, the different layers show you here that there's archaeology on the ground floor, there's market on the, uh, archaeology on the basement, market on the ground floor, an elevated plaza as a roof on, to on top of the market, and then um, you have the parasol, which then takes the stems all the way down into the archaeology. What you see here is um, the beige as the timber part. We were looking to different forms of constructing it. And timber was always the one that was the winning scheme in relationship to um, cost control, prefabrication qualities, sound uh, or noise control, um, issues of like, behavior when it's cooling down and heating up during the day. For larger spans, it, we needed steel and concrete, but basically all the parasol um, parts are in timber. And so we worked with Arab engineers and um, Finforest Merck as the timber company and developed ideas how to put this together. The timber came from Finland and um, then it was produced in Munich, shipped to Seville, coated in Seville, brought onto the site and put together here on this um, scheme with um, the different steel elements and steel joints, about 4,000 that we had here. This is um, the archaeology with um, the steel structure that runs across all the um, excavations and the mosaic. And then when we put it together here um, for the stems, you see these steel shoes that hold them together. But once it's cantilevering, we have a different form of structure, which is steel joints that are glued into the timber, um, which is another innovation part um, that we introduced to the site next to the timber with the polyurethane coating.
You see the steel joints here. There are these metal rods that go into the timber here. This is glued in. Um, and you also see how the forces jump from like stronger forces to less forces here, and the material joints and the material thickness also jumps from one to the other. And that's partly due because um, we don't have a radial system that is kind of an engineering way to look at it, but it's an uh, uh, orthogonal system that actually works against the way the forces work, and therefore it has these very interesting moments of um, let's say, uh, detailed uh, reaction or detailed, um, let's say, ad, uh, adjustments, for example, from one material thickness to the other one. When you look at it from the sky, it's a very transparent um, structure, but where we have the cafe and the conference rooms, that's when we have a roof. Otherwise, it's very transparent and open to the sky. So once it arrived, and you see here the dialogue to the um, historic buildings around it, um, it really starts to kind of glow and to work in, you know, in response to the city fabric. The shadow, which is one of the you know, important parts from the very beginning of the design scheme, also creates an animated surface here on the ground floor. Um, and so this is how it looks during the, you know, the noon moment of the day. A little later, it might already look like this, so it um, changes also the appearance and the, the effects of that shade on the ground floor. Um, it hits itself also um, with different configurations of shadow. And this is the structure, how it's kind of projected from the top down. Some use, like when it was opened in 2011, a view from the roof. Also here you see again how the forces then change the thickness of the structure from very thick where the forces run through to very skinny and thin. So it's kind of a fine tuning that you know, shows you um, how sensitive it was to calculate this. And we, I remember it took about three months for the engineers to calculate this roof. And if you forget the direction of the wood fibers, you might have to do it again for another three weeks. So today it would be easier and faster to, um, to, to, to use uh, you know, software to develop this, but it was somehow at the edge of what was possible at the time. And this is then the view at night. <coughs> but now I want to show you how it really arrived in the city. Um, this one um, is part of the city, uh, city advertisements once it was established. Of course, there was also a little bit of uh, anti-movement uh, for the project. This here um, but shows that the Catholic Church, who didn't really like so much our project in the planning phase, was quite happy once it was established. And Semana Santa is the week before Easter when they have these floats um, that actually were carried through the city, um, and they also realized that it was helping them um, to advertise the Semana Santa. Also, schools in the neighborhood, you know, built the little um, crib <laughs> that works. So this is Semana Santa. It's maybe the most important week in Seville. You have these floats. You hear these like 20 men carrying this structure. It's very heavy with this breath. Um, here, another one. This is another Semana Santa moment, and you can see how popular it is, and especially with these stairs, it becomes quite, um, uh, quite a moment to look at. But also it works for flamenco or traditional music, it works for political demonstrations and talks, basically the place to talk about the future of the culture. Um, on all like, levels, this was this year, um, demonstrations against the new right-wing party, um, or this was at the beginning, when it, um, in 2011-12, when Podemos and the Indignados were discussing about the future of Spain and you know and their culture and their their their, their survi economic survival, basically, um, Podemos, that party, was founded on Metropol Parasol. They even used it as part of their logo. So it's all about kind of discussing what is future, what are the changes, how can we deal with it. Um, there were sitting groups, there were um, you know, each stem had a different function. One was the kitchen, one was the Wi-Fi zone, one was um, signing up for workshops. 
at that time you were also able to sleep overnight because discussing about the future is exhausting. Um, this is maybe a regular evening, you know, in Seville when it's nice in summer, um, but it also works for cheesy Latino pop. Um, uh, if you go online, um, look at music videos. It works also for hip hop. I, um, it also works, you know, for more cheesy Latino pop. Um, this is on the roof. Uh, it works for Bollywood music and for cheesy Swiss um, chansons. Um, Miss Spain was competing to become Miss Universe. It didn't work, but she took pictures for that campaign on the roof. This year, beige is supposedly the color of the season. Um, Harper's Bazaar took a whole photo shoot up on Metropole Paris. So. New Balance felt inspired for their souls here. Um, public viewing works really well on the plaza. Also, cars like it. Um, so Mercedes-Benz, you know, we designed it um, digitally. We would never do a floor like this, but um, they designed it. But BMW was there, or Jeep, Volkswagen. They moved it somewhere else. Um, Renault was there. Of course, social media likes it, and um, also dating apps uh, seem to be successful with it. <laughs> this is Tinder and Grinder. It always makes you look bigger, right? <laughs> but I also saw some which only had the parasol, so I don't know what you want to tell with that. Uh, here, you see that, yeah. So Amanda looks like this, and um, <laughs> the other guy looks like this. But um, also, of course, it creates a certain hype about uh, for tourism, which is the success they wanted. At the same time, of course, also creates all the issues that we see these days with you know, mass tourism, Airbnb culture, housing costs going up, and so forth. But it was on the cover of Lonely Planet. Um, it was the place to travel to number one, Lonely Planet, in 2008. And of course, then you have demonstrations against tourism. So what you call for, you know, also then creates a certain, you know, effect and needs to be kind of discussed and balanced. Um, but all kinds of challenges happen, like a Red Bull challenge. Um, this is gay pride. This is a cartoon festival. Um, fashion then happens and all the products that come with it. Tourists, souvenirs, catalogs, um, calendars, street paintings. Um, but then I also now get um, images from friends all over the world and somehow it, I think the project caught a moment which has offsprings or you know, something that is this universal grid that materializes in some parts. Um, so this is a TV sports show from India that friends sent me, um, shopping lounges, uh, airport lounges. Um, competition entries that people sent me, friends sent me. So if you find some um, sent to me, I like to collect them um, and <laughs> show them. Even goes down to furniture and to very tiny um, objects. <laughs> and I always wanted to present or finish my talk with a cat video, so you get one. Die Natur hat einen schlauen Weg erfunden, Feuchtigkeit aufzunehmen. Nach diesem Prinzip haben wir Cats Best entwickelt. Die pflanzliche Katzenstreu aus technologisch veredelten Aktivholzfasern, die Feuchtigkeit und Gerüche aufnehmen und einschließen. Und so auf vollkommen natürliche Weise bis zum Siebenfachen ihres Volumens binden. Kompakt, ganz leicht zu entfernen. Und so hygienisch, dass die Streu bis zu sieben Wochen im Katzenklo bleiben kann, bevor der nächste Komplettwechsel fällig ist. Eine rundum saubere Sache. Cats Best. The power of nature. So you understand why, um, you know, uh, why it appeared. Uh, you saw these little microscopic um, entities. It's an uh, innovative wood fiber. And the company who produced that um, did different designs for their packaging. They found also parasol, and in comparison to other designs, their test audience always voted for the parasol as being the one that should be on the packaging. So um, I was kind of 
irritated first, and now I'm kind of happy that it's already, you know, part of cat culture. Um, but you see also, and maybe this brings me back to the beginning, from a very small, tiny obsession um, that, you know, we started to look into and enlarge that step by step from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, all the way back to maybe the microscopic. Um, there is somehow an idea of how everything somehow belongs to each other, but also once you get into one certain topic, um, you discover a whole universe. And this is what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you so much.